If you've been driving a vehicle during the warm months in the last few years, something has been missing. You probably have not even noticed that hardly any insects have been hitting your windshield, especially at night. It's difficult to notice something as irritating as insects on the windshield that are missing, yet it represents an important change. Hi, I'm Oren Gelderloos, a faculty member at the University of Michigan Dearborn in the Departments of Biology and Environmental Studies, and I'm going to connect the disappearance of insects on your windshield to the topic of biodiversity. The topic of biodiversity have popped up in the news during the past few months, namely April and May in 2019. Biodiversity is a combination of the words hit biological and diversity. And it refers to the great variability among all living creatures and organisms on our planet and the habitats and ecosystems in which they live. So where did the term biodiversity come from? In 1980, the term was first used as the title of a conference on this topic in Washington, D.C. And the results of that conference have been published in a volume of the same name and edited by the distinguished Harvard professor Edward O. Wilson. Recently, leaders of 132 governments from around the world met in Paris and offered their assessment of the state of plants and animals on the planet. These leaders are members of the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES. The attention-grabbing headlines from this report stated that we stand to lose one million species on our planet. Well, that brings up the question, how many species are on our planet? Well, we can only estimate and that estimate is about 8.7 million, give or take 1.3 million. Other estimates are 5 to 40 million different kinds of plants and animals, fungi, and microbes. With numbers in the millions, we have a high degree of uncertainty. How is it possible to make such estimates? Well, one way is to recognize that each species that we know has at least one species on which it preys and at least one species that prey on it. Also, each species has at least one parasite and at least one fungus that lives on it. But you may say that with all our ability to travel the planet and explore the mountains and the oceans, certainly we'll get the number right with our greater certainty with our scientific technology, right? Well, after 250 years of documenting thousands of new plants and animals every year, the rate at which new species are discovered remains relatively stable. Somewhere between 15,000 and 18,000 new species are identified each year, with about half of those being insects. At the same time, the actions of humans are decreasing the number of species at a record rate and that's where the number one million species loss in the future comes from. So let's take a look at some of the causes of extinction of so many species. There are several causes. First, we can recognize habitat loss. The IPBES report states that on land, more than a third of the world's land surface and nearly 75% of the freshwater resources are now devoted to crop or livestock production. That means that farms cut into forests that typically trap carbon have expanded exponentially, increasing crop production by 300% since 1970. I have traveled to India 17 times over the last 25 years, and the people there are very disturbed at the growth that's taking place from the cities out over the rice paddies and that is where their food supply comes from. So they decry the urbanization even in India. As consequently, we have destroyed natural ecosystems that provide untold benefits with their ecosystem services. A second cause is the reduction of trees for more houses, driveways, lawns, parking lots, and large buildings. 
which reduce the food sources of thousands of insect larvae. For example, more than 100 species of insect larvae feed on the common cottonwood tree alone. Another cause is the use of pesticides for agriculture. It then probably reduces the insects that are used to hit your windshield. Using pesticides in your garden and a bug zapper to kill mosquitoes kills many other species as well besides mosquitoes. A fourth cause is that water supply shortages are increasing throughout the planet, which puts stress on plants and animals and causes them to die off. Another cause is that plastics in the ocean break into microscopic particles that are consumed by fish and kill them. And these are the fish that for now we are eating. A sixth cause can be that global climate change affects the survival of many species and it, they can die because their food supplies disappear. The transportation of organisms around the world without knowing that we are doing it produces invasive species such as the Dutch elm disease and the demise of the ash trees in the Midwest due to the emerald ash borer. This transportation is the greatest immigration that we have ever seen in the world. And finally, let's keep in mind that the human population on the planet has tripled since 1950, and it's still increasing to an expected 9 billion people in the next few decades. As a summary, the Intergovernmental Report states that Humans extract 60 billion tons from nature each year to satisfy demands for worldwide crops, fish, minerals, and other goods. The authors of the report said this is unsustainable. The statement of unsustainability means that we are taking more from our natural bank account than nature is capable of replacing. For example, we are pumping water out of the Ogallala Aquifer for irrigation of monocultures of corn and other crops 50 times faster than nature is replacing it. Also, the ores that we mine pollute the streams, and the mountaintops we remove for coal will never be replaced. So who cares if one million species go extinct? Well, I do for one, and I think my great-grandchildren will too. A great deal of the food on our planet comes from plants whose flowers are pollinated by animal pollinators, mostly insects. But you say, what does that have to do with me? Most, if not all of us, do not grow and pollinate the tomatoes, apricots, apples, cherries, raspberries, peaches, and mangoes that we eat. We have someone else do it. And keep in mind that $577 billion worth of food production per year on our globe is facilitated by pollinators, most of them insects. This pollination activity is called an ecosystem service for which we pay nothing. The report from the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services presents a case for biodiversity and extinction of species on the scale for the planet. But how are you and I involved in this issue directly? Well, consider what we judge to be a, a person who is a patriotic American. Over the years, we've developed the mentality that a good-looking neighborhood is one in which we have beautiful green lawns. We are proud of our lawns and they reflect the values of beauty that we hold. Yet, what is the level of biodiversity that we have in our lawns? Our goal seems to be zero biodiversity. In other words, our lawns are a monoculture, and we maintain this monoculture with herbicides and insecticides. These in, these Herbicides and insecticides eliminate dozens of species of plants and insects, including pollinators. Often when we look at a corn and wheat field, 
as huge monocultures, we despair about their lack of biodiversity. Yet the lawns of America constitute the greatest monoculture and lack of biodiversity that our country has ever seen. Thus, we need to work on what we consider beautiful and aesthetically pleasing and consider how to turn our yards into polycultures with native species and plants which support a variety of pollinators if we are really serious about increasing biodiversity on our planet. And yet you may say, if we have over 8 million species, what difference does it make if we lose a million species? Well, think of this. Suppose an airplane, which has thousands of rivets in it to hold it together, loses a rivet. Does anything happen? Probably not. What about two rivets? What if the loss of one rivet causes a domino effect and more rivets pop due to the loss of one? So we need to deal with the question, how complex and complicated is the world in which we live? Do you know? I certainly do not, nor does anyone else on this planet know. Many people think that they do know, but they forget about the unintended consequences of their actions and in the way we live. For example, we never thought that the millions of passenger pigeons could ever become extinct. Yet, when we deforested the Great Lakes watershed, we killed off all the passenger pigeons. So, if the topic of biodiversity was brought to our attention nearly 40 years ago at the conference in Washington, D.C., why are we still shocked at the possibility of the loss of a million species? We have to look at the root cause of our loss of biodiversity. It's the extreme complexity of how our planet operates and our ignorance of it. We need to recognize that we are arrogant and show arrogance when we think that we know how the world works. We know a lot, but not enough. The issue of biodiversity falls in the category of wicked problems or grand challenges. Such problems are defined as those which have no solution and to which no person or government has any accountability. Furthermore, in the paraphrased words of H.L. Mencken in another context, for every wicked problem and grand challenge, there is a simple answer, and it is wrong. So when it comes to caring for the creatures and the ecosystems in which we live, we should begin with a large daily dose of humility and a debt of gratitude for all the creatures with which we share the planet and all the benefits that they give to us. As far as we know, we do not have planet B. So now, wonder why you do not need to clean the insects off from your windshield when you stop to fill your gasoline tank. <laughs>